Welcome to our university conference. It's obvious that while the timing of this event and the subsequent commencement of classes next week will follow a long-standing traditional pattern, much of the coming school year and even the format of this program will be quite different from what we have come to expect. Some of those differences are the result of pre-planned improvements. Some are the result of the coronavirus pandemic. To use the scriptural phrase in 2 Nephi chapter 2, we have both acted and been acted upon during this past year. And the result is that this year is much different from previous years. The dramatic nature of the, these differences, as well as their two major causes, acting and being acted upon, are illustrated by the two most distinctive features of the setting in which we find ourselves this morning. I'm presenting from a platform different from the traditional stand and podium we've used for this meeting in the past. And you are sitting, well, I don't exactly know where you're sitting, but it is clearly not in the Marriott Center where we usually gather. Now, the first difference is a result of our acting. It is a pre-planned innovation that we debuted on March 9th when Steve Sandberg presented his moving devotional on forgiveness. The latter change was introduced the very next week on March 16th, when Elder Jack Gerard gave an equally impressive devotional on trusting God to a completely empty Marriott Center because of concerns about the coronavirus pandemic, a clear example of being acted upon. In the intervening week between those two devotionals, the world changed dramatically for everyone in our campus community. In a period of only five days, we completely changed the mode of instruction for almost every class and rethought and reconfigured almost every service we offer on campus to make it safe for both our students and our employees to accomplish what they set out to do despite the devastating effects of the worst pandemic of our lifetime. Let me once again thank each of you for your part in what I can only describe as a miracle, an ongoing miracle that continues to this day as so many have worked so hard and so diligently to prepare for the return of our students to what is still a unique and precarious environment. Your monumental actions provi provide definitive proof that we can act even while being acted upon and that because of Christ's atoning power in the long run, the impact of our actions can overcome all things that act upon us. Because that is one lesson I hope you take away from my message today, let me repeat it. We can act even while being acted upon. And because of Christ's atoning power, the impact of our actions can overcome all things that act upon us. The changes that have occurred on campus over the past five months are so monumental that many of us mentally divide our prior year's BYU experience into BC, before COVID, and AC, after COVID. With March 12th, the date on which we announced we would shift to remote instruction as the dividing line. That is both understandable and natural. However, if we overly emphasize that divide, if we, can re if we remember and judge this past year solely by the dramatic changes that occurred beginning March 12th, we may deprive ourselves of the full blessings, joy, and progress that God intends us to derive from our experiences this past year. Let me give a couple of instructive examples. First, if we focus solely on how significantly things have changed since March 12th, we may miss the opportunity to celebrate and be re-energized by the numerous accomplishments that occurred last year, many of which happened before March 12th. Last year was an amazing year in that regard. Just to cite a few examples of our students' successes. Students from the Marriott School of Business took first place in at least five different competitions. Pictured here are the winners of the International Business Model Competition, Zoya Ali, Abby Warner, and Timey Kennerly. Students from the Animation Program, which is a collaboration between the College of Fine Arts and Communications and the College of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, won their sixth Student Academy Award for their short, Grendel. Students from the animation program also made history by winning first place in two categories at the Intel University Games. Their video game, Avashji, received first place for both best game play and best visual design, becoming the first team to win two first place prizes in the same year. 
Examples of achievements can be found in other aspects of the university operations. Construction on the new Westview building commenced prior to March 12th and was completed after that date. It is now ready to be occupied. The last phase of our Heritage Hall's living facilities is also being completed. And approval was given and construction has begun, begun on a new music building. In athletics, the men's cross country team won the NCAA national championship. And the women's cross country team took second in their national championship event. The women's soccer team advanced to the Elite Eight round of the NCAA tournament. And at the end of the fall 2019 season, BYU is ranked fifth in the Learfield IMG Directors' Cup standings, which measures overall success among the more than 350 NCAA Division I programs. The men's volleyball team finished its season ranked number one in the nation. And the men's basketball team was ranked 16th in its final poll. Now we know in both cases their season was truncated by the pandemic. That rightly gives them and us cause for some lament. But please don't let us focus so much on what might have been that we miss out on the joy and strength that comes from celebrating what was and is. In that regard, let me note that in a typical year, the stand at this conference is filled with recipients of various university awards. This year, we are recognizing 47 individuals for their unique and outstanding service to the university. Each has demonstrated exceptional competency and sacrifice in their work. I honor each of them and express my personal appreciation to them. While we are unable to have them join us here in this meeting because of our circumstances, I hope you will take time to read about them in upcoming Y News articles and in the University Conference Awardee Booklet that will be available online at the conference website. I urge each of you this week and following weeks to take some time in your own departments and units to recognize the accomplishments of this past year and don't limit them to the events in the after COVID era. Celebrate and recognize even the good things that were interrupted by the arrival of the coronavirus in Provo. The recognition that your God-given power to act produced good fruit before the pandemic can strengthen your faith that he will grant you the necessary power to act and overcome the challenge that will arise during and after the pandemic. Celebrating the past can help us remember that because of Christ's atoning power, the impact of our actions can overcome all things that act upon us. Second, too much focus on the before COVID, after COVID divide may both unnecessarily discourage us and keep us from realizing our remarkable potential as a university. If we view the world solely through the before COVID, after COVID lens, we may erroneously conclude that we have only two long-term choices. On the one hand, we can hunker down and weather the storm with the hope that when it is over, we can pick up the surviving artifacts of the pre-March 12th world and piece them back together in a way that will enable us to return to our prior unaltered plans, surviving but otherwise unaffected by the pandemic experience. Alternatively, we could conclude that the pandem pandemic is such a disruptive force that we should jettison all our prior plans and traditions and accept a new normal that is so radically different from our pre-March 12th days that what we did before is automatically suspect and in need of replacement. In short, overemphasizing the divide between the pre and post pandemic world may cause us to wrongfully believe that eventually we'll have to either ignore the present hoping it goes away quickly, or ignore the past, hoping it never returns. In my view, both those options are less than optimal. Fortunately, neither is inevitable. I believe that if we fully engage, process, and remember the experiences of this present pandemic world, we can bring together the past and the present to make a better future. I hope we don't just survive this unusual experience, but that we lean into it in a way that both reconfirms the essential components of our prior core goals and also accelerates our progress toward them. That is admittedly a very ambitious, audacious, and some would say unrealistic aspiration. But I believe that we are better positioned than any other university to do this, that we were, if you will, built for this. The theme of this conference provides a key for how we can achieve this lofty goal. 
The theme comes from the 64th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 33. Be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work. That verse contains both an admonition and a motivating reason for following that admonition. Both are especially relevant in the COVID world in which we currently find ourselves. The admonition is very simple. Be not weary in well-doing. That advice seems tailored specifically to the situation in which we find ourselves. It is so easy to become weary in this very uncertain COVID world where everything seems to be dynamic and fluid and where projections change overnight. The term COVID fatigue has now entered our lexicon. It is used to describe a number of different phenomena and several different causes of the varying conditions have been identified. But surely one of the principal components of COVID fatigue is the seemingly ubiquitous uncertainty that surrounds almost every decision we are currently dealing with. It is difficult and incredibly draining to work in an, env in an environment where you don't know if the plans you are so carefully creating will be effective or even possible. It is still more enervating to repeatedly see that your work is undone by unexpected developments, sometimes even before the task is started. We are and have been operating in what cognitive psychologist Robin Hogarth calls a wicked learning and decision-making environment. One in which there are no obvious patterns and feedback is often delayed, inaccurate, or both. It is easier to work in what Hogarth calls a kind environment where patterns repeat over and over and feedback is extremely accurate and usually very rapid. That definition of a kind decision-making environment may describe much of what we did day to day before March 12th, but it is clearly not what most of us have been dealing with since. It is hard to operate in a wicked environment because as Hogarth has pointed out, there is so much uncertainty and misinformation that reliance on one's prior experience often leads to exactly the wrong conclusion with disastrous results. Operating in that type of environment for long can be exhausting, unless. Unless one has both a higher vision and a higher, more accurate source of feedback. And this is where the second part of our scriptural theme comes into play. The Lord's admonition that we be not weary in well-doing is accompanied by a statement that is both an explanation for why we should not be weary and a motivation for avoiding that mindset. We should not and need not be weary because we are laying the foundation of a great work. We are engaged in an endeavor that is of enormous import. And it is a work that is not ours alone, but also God's. If we truly believe that as our mission statement declares, our task is to assist individuals in their quest for perfection and eternal life, we should proceed with full confidence that our work is both essential and God-directed and supported. That understanding will provide the most compelling motivation for not becoming weary in well-doing. We can be assured that notwithstanding our current circumstances, God will give us the knowledge and ability to act in ways that will overcome all the effects of being acted upon. Some may suggest that given the significant nature of the changes that have occurred, we should dramatically revise or even abandon our mission statement to adapt to the new normal. I believe that would be a serious mistake. We are and have been for our entire history engaged in a work that is enduring even everlasting. We are laying a foundation for the eternities, not erecting a tent for temporary shelter. With that in mind, let me briefly, re briefly review at a high level the things we have been working on the, in the past few years and that we will continue to work on in the next few years, notwithstanding the pandemic. These come from the strategic five-year plan that we have developed as a President's Council. There are three main strategic, uh, strategic objectives. Each is grounded in specific provisions of the mission statement and aims of a BYU education. Note in that regard that the first objective is to ensure alignment with the university mission. The second is to enhance the educational experience of our students, knowing that the shape of that educational experience is outlined in the mission statement and aims. And the third objective is to expand enrollment, to make this mission-aligned enhanced education available to more students. 
there are several more layers of details associated with each of these three strategic objectives. Let me share just the next level so that you can see in a bit more detail what I believe we should continue to focus on even as we adjust to and emerge from the pandemic. There are four major aspects of the effort to align ourselves with the university mission. The first is to ensure that our hiring process processes focus not just on the secular skills required, but also, and more importantly, on mission fit. The second is to ensure that our teaching and learning is faith-based and our research and scholarship is student-centered. I have attempted to describe what those two terms mean in prior university conference addresses that I believe are still relevant. Finally, we want to promote a sense of belonging among all members of the campus community. In that regard, let me thank and acknowledge both the members of our University Committee on Race, Equity, and Belonging, and those involved in similar efforts in the various colleges and other units on campus. Both gospel principles and our mission state statement commit us to developing a loving, genuine concern for the welfare of all of God's children, regardless of their race, gender, sexual orientation, or other distinguishing feature each of which is secondary to our common identity as beloved spirits, sons and daughters of heavenly parents. In order to enhance the educational experience of our students, the second objective, we will continue to focus on inspiring learning, expanding and enhancing experiential learning opportunities, as well as improving classroom instruction. We will also continue to work to improve access to limited enrollment programs and develop BYU online classes. Third, we will continue to work on our plan to offer our enhanced educational experience to more students by expanding enrollment by up to 3,000 more student FTEs over a six-year period. I should report that it appears we may have started out at a more accelerated rate than we had intended this year because of the early entry of a number of missionaries whose service was interrupted by the pandemic. But as with most things, we will be able to make the necessary adjustments while continuing to stay on course. Now we'll have a chance to discuss both our progress and our plans in each of these areas more in depth in the co coming months. But I think it helpful that we clearly communicate at the start of this academic year, our intention to continue to focus on our pre-March 12th priorities. What was important before that date remains important today. However, as I stated earlier, that doesn't mean that our plan is to batten down the hatches and wait out the storm, hoping to emerge unaffected. This COVID experience, like all our mortal experiences, can and should help us improve. If we emerge from the pandemic unscathed but unchanged, we will have missed out on the full benefit of this unique experience. Let me give just a few quick concrete examples of ways in which our ability to achieve our pre-March 12th goals may be enhanced by the pandemic experience we are going through. You will recall that one of the ways we have been working to enhance the educational experience of our students is through the continued development of BYU Online. As many of you know, BYU Online courses are designed not to provide online degrees or programs to those who can never come to our campus, but rather to enhance the education of our on-campus matriculated students by helping them become lifelong online learners and providing them increased scheduling flexibility. It also frees up classroom space to help with our expanded enrollment plans. We first began the BYU online program as a pilot eight years ago, relying primarily on college and department volunteers. After seven years, we had reached the point where last fall semester, we offered 101 courses with 249 sections, which resulted in just over 11,000 enrollments. Following the sudden change to remote delivery on March 12th, there has been increased interest in quality online options among colleges and departments, as they have seen the ways in which student learning can be enhanced by online courses designed at the outset for that kind of experience. As a result, this coming fall semester, we are offering 136 BYU online courses with 415 sections, resulting in over 26,000 enrollments in BYU online courses. As you will see, that represents a 35% increase in the number of courses, 
a 67% increase in sections offered, and a 130% increase in the number of enrollments. I seriously doubt our BYU online offerings would be nearly as robust in either number or quality without the pandemic. This does not mean that we will move to a system in which online learning becomes the exclusive or even primary means of instruction, or that we will, will abandon other modes of instruction that are equally important to the balanced development of the total person, which our mission statement commits us. But this aspect of our efforts to enhance the learning experience of our students has clearly been accelerated by our post-March 12th experience. I believe that experience will also improve our in-person classroom teaching, which is a key component to the faith-based teaching and learning we hope occurs here. As a result of the involuntary shift to remote instruction, I believe most faculty will be more adept and more comfortable in using technology to enhance learning even in the in-person classroom setting. I believe many have already and more will in the future think more deeply about how they present material in a classroom setting. If all we do in a classroom setting is deliver a pre-scripted lecture, we must now surely ask ourselves if we need to meet in person for that purpose, or if there is something else that could be done in what we now realize is extremely precious and limited and valuable face-to-face -face classroom time. The pandemic experience should make us more willing and able to try new things, to connect more effectively with our students in ways that enhance and deepen their understanding of the subjects we are teaching. Let me provide an example of an effort that was going on before last winter semester, before the pandemic, but which illustrates the kind of creativity I hope our post-March 12th experience causes us to consider more frequently. I learned the gospel visually before I ever learned it through the printed word. Traditionally in academia, we like students to read things and write things, but what about the students who don't express their learning through writing as well? The Foundations of the Restoration class is one of the new cornerstone classes to help students get a broader understanding of church history and doctrine. I wanted to have their culminating project have some requirements but how you show your learning is open-ended. I believe it was on the first day of class is where he introduced um, this restoration project that we'd be working on. We were to make a product. we just make something. So that was a little weird to me because he literally said anything, but it didn't take me long to think, I love music. Music has been a huge part of my life. And so we decided we would do our main research on the early hymns of the church. We decided to find a song that is not in the hymn book anymore. We learned that in that first hymn book, there was no um, arranged music. We finally came across one hymn that really struck us, and it was called, My Soul is Full of Peace and Love. We read it, and we immediately felt something special about that. The lyrics of that song just brought so much peace and comfort to us as we read them. Now we just needed to put music. My soul is full of peace and love. I soon shall see Christ from above and angels to the hallowed throne shall join with me in holy song. We learned that the song came as a result of, of a revelation on gift of tongues. That touched me. Um, in the moment because English is not my first language so I struggle with it sometimes. I constantly see God's help to help me with, with the gift of tongues and um, I felt like I got a personal connection to the song. In my own art as I paint, I go through this process of learning about something about church history and doctrine, researching it and then thinking about how I want to express it. I want students to go through that exact same experience in ways that speak to them. And then it gets them to think also about how do I express our church history and doctrine in ways that speak to people. The broader success is if I find the students sharing it with other people, saying, let me show you what I'm working on, let me show you what I've learned. And the thought came to me, it's really valuable for their peers to see what each other are producing. Uh, the first time we did the fair, the feeling was electric. I thought, why have I not been doing this all along? 
all the projects were so drastically different. There was a lot of pieces of art, sculptures. I remember someone created a, like a stained glass mural. These are the symbols on the Nauvoo Temple, and then the wood around the edges is real wood from the floorboards of the Nauvoo Temple that my uncle brought home after building it. I've had students create computer programs, apps, uh, videos, poems, books, musical scores, raps, film, any creative product you can think of, these thousands of students have likely produced something in that field. In a class like this, you're not just learning history, you're learning about people and events and doctrine so that you can see yourself in the restoration. And we all come from different backgrounds, so a project being so unique that was the tool that was gonna make the restoration a personal testimony for each and everybody. Enjoy the bands and songs of love. Now our current circumstances prohibit us from gathering together in that kind of crowded environment you saw in that video, but I'm convinced that if we think carefully and receive inspiration, we will be enlightened as to ways in which we can make our classroom experience come alive as we think about how we use, again, that very precious time. I also believe that our pandemic experience can help us reach our goal to promote a greater sense of belonging among all members of our campus community. I hope the physical and ge geographical separation that, that this pandemic has forced upon us will give us greater appreciation of the benefits we can all derive from our relationships with others especially those whose background is different from our own. If we reflect on the loneliness almost all of us have felt at times these past five months because of physical separation, I hope we will, be able to, we will be, all be quicker to look for and reach out to those who's, who experience that loneliness even when they are surrounded by people. I also hope that the less frequent interaction we have experienced since March 12th will cause us to be more kind, more patient, and less quick to judge that we'll focus more on others rather than on ourselves, and that we will be more committed to demonstrating in the words of our mission statement, a loving, genuine concern for the welfare of our neighbor. Even in doing things as small and simple as wearing a face mask in public buildings and other places where the safety of others might be compromised. Finally, this pandemic has provided us with a remarkable opportunity to increase our ability to deal with uncertainty. As I noted before, the pandemic may present the most wicked learning and decision-making environment that most of us have experienced in our lifetimes. However, I am confident it will not be the last time we encounter such a situation. Many, including one of our forum speakers this year, David Epstein, have concluded even before the pandemic that we are living in a rapidly changing wicked world. The ability to adapt and move forward in such settings is increasingly important in today's society. And we can provide opportunities for our students to learn this skill in a wide variety of settings. A good illustration of this is in the following video, which shows how Professor Paul Adams helps students learn how to adapt to new ideas using an old technology, which for them was fraught with all kinds of uncertainty. The project we're currently working on is called Vanishing Voices. We are attempting to take portraits of the last known speakers of languages that are currently really endangered and, and about to be lost. We found out that there was well over 800 languages just in the United States that are endangered. And we started then on this journey of trying to find these language speakers. They represent to me an aspect of our culture that's disappearing. We chose to use what's referred to as a wet plate collodion tintype to uh, photograph these people, which is the same photographic process that was used in the 1800s. We have to pull this mobile darkroom with us, so wherever they are, we have to be able to drive to them. This project is really laborious, and there's a lot of opportunities for failure. The actual physical process of recording a tintype image is you put a plate into the camera, the plate has been coated with a light sensitive material so that the light reflecting off of the person is actually embedded into the plate. A tintype plate has such a low ISO basically that you have to just put tons of light into it and so those basic elements of lighting become really important and you can't just take a snapshot 
to test the lighting on a digital camera. We can bring it out of the trailer into the daylight, and then we slide it into a tray of fixer, and then all of a sudden an image just materializes out of this fluid, and they just are uh, kind of uh, spellbound. When Lucille saw her tintype, she started to speak a very traditional prayer in her own language. She spoke a lot about how she, in that moment, felt connected with those who had come before her. They're seeing photographs of themselves like they saw their ancestors. I don't know of any other university that has the camera that we have, that has the tintype equipment that we have. We use a 20 by 24 inch camera and the, they're extremely rare. We use a lens that was handmade from the mid 1800s. It's okay popping me back of the head, but other than that, I'm okay. That is also extremely rare. And students get hands-on experience with that. And you might ask, well, they'll never use this equipment later. What's beneficial to them about this? It actually teaches them how to be artists. And it also teaches them how to kind of slow down and learn the discipline of being a photographer. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's remarkable. Look at you. That is amazing though, the way that. And they take that kind of discipline with them wherever they go once they leave BYU. So I think experiential learning is really important for a student to be able to connect things that might be separated when you're just learning in a classroom. And I think it's really important to get hands-on experience. I'm very grateful to BYU for the way it fosters learning and, and fosters an environment where students can leave the classroom and have the tools that they need to push their education and, and really launch themselves post-graduation. So we have a plate that was accepted into the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. It feels pretty amazing to have something in the Smithsonian. Not a lot of work gets there, and so I, I feel very blessed and very honored. Tintypes are one of the most archival processes that have ever been created. They will last hundreds and hundreds of years. Each tintype is very, very unique. You can't reproduce it. You can't just as easily create another one that looks just like it. And that's exactly like the people that we're photographing because they are important and they are special and they are very unique. <laughs> This tintype image is a process that is very unforgiving and exacting. You have to get the mixture right in terms of coating the plating. You have to keep people still for a long period of time. And if there's a flaw, it comes out and is there forever. It is sort of a wicked environment for these students, including that the mixture of the chemicals themselves are flammable. Now, the students involved in this project not only learned how to produ produce tintype images, which, as the video showed, led directly to one graduate's current job, they also developed the critical skill of dealing with the uncertainty inherent in using what for them was an entirely new and foreign method of photography, a skill that will serve them well regardless of the occupation they choose or the photographic equipment they use. More importantly, as Elder Bruce C. Hafen has noted, Learning how to deal with uncertainty, especially how to understand and live with the competing true principles, is an essential skill in our eternal development. One of the purposes of this mortal existence is to learn to proceed with faith, even in the face of great uncertainty. When there is no guarantee, other than God's word, that things will work out for our good. If we can learn to deal with such uncertainty and ambiguities with a believing attitude, Elder Hafen notes, our faithful choices will ultimately lead to our sanctification. Thus, learning how to deal with the unexpected and unpredictable, such as a coronavirus pandemic, can not only prepare our students to be capable of meeting personal challenge and change, as a portion of our mission statement provides, it can also help them achieve the full realization of human potential that another portion of that statement requires us to do. Our challenge, therefore, is not just to survive the pandemic, but to learn from it by acting with faith, even in the face of uncertainty, trusting that God can truly make all things work together for our good, as he has said. We have a legacy in this church of meeting such challenges. Let me share one simple example from our history. 
From the earliest days of his arrival in the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young focused on building a temple. It was one of his primary goals. After years of work, progress began to be made, but even then, other events, events that no doubt caused the saints to feel acted upon, came into play. Our former colleague, Richard Cowan, described one of those events this way. He wrote, on July 24th, 1857, as the Latter-day Saints were celebrating the 10th anniversary of their entrance into Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Valley, they received the disturbing news that a potentially hostile United States Army was approaching Utah. Not knowing the Army's intentions, Brigham Young had the Temple Foundation covered with, a dirt, with dirt as a precaution. When the Army arrived the following year, Temple Square looked like a freshly plowed field, and there was no visible evidence of the Temple's construction. As it turned out, the Army marched through Salt Lake City without harming any property and set up its camp some 30 miles to the southwest near Utah Lake. Even during the years when the Army was in Utah, however, draftsmen in the architect's office were busy planning the exact size and shape for each of the thousands of stones that would be needed for the temple. With the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861, the Army was needed elsewhere, and it departed from Utah by December of that year. The foundation was uncovered in preparation for work that would resume the following spring. Now at this point, the saints had survived their version of a pandemic, but they did it while continuing to focus on their temple building mission by doing the work the best they could under the circumstances. Once the threat was gone, they returned to the task with eagerness. However, something was different. Again, to quote Professor Cowan, at this time, President Young examined the newly uncovered foundation and became aware that it was defective. He and his associates noticed large cracks and concluded that its small stones held together with mortar could not carry the massive weight of the temple. On January 1st, 1862, shortly after the army had left, Brother Brigham announced that the inadequate foundation would be removed and replaced by one made entirely of granite. The footings would be 16 feet thick. I want to see the temple built in a manner that it will endure through the millennium, Brigham later declared. Now, I'm certain that Johnston's army was not a welcome sight to the saints in 1857. They may have viewed it as a threat not unlike a pandemic. Their first instinct was just to survive. But they resisted that and continued to work on their prior plans as best they could. And when the danger was gone, they found new insights that allowed them to build an even better and longer lasting temple. Would they have discovered the cracks in the foundation if their work had not been interrupted by the army? I don't know. But I do know that they emerged from a crisis with a better foundation because they did not abandon the project. They learned that while they could act, that they could act even while being acted upon and that because of Christ's atoning power, the impact of their actions could overcome all things that acted upon them. Now, although I have focused primarily on the traditional educational processes led by our outstanding faculty in the examples I've provided, there is a role for everyone in every unit to play in this process, including our academic support units. And their role is not limited to providing ind the indispensable support to the academic colleges and departments that they provide. As amazing as those support efforts have been in the past five months, and they have been magnificent, the efforts of our academic support units in the central part of educating our students in a variety of ways have been equally impressive. The results may not be as widely known, but for some of our students, they are as eternally significant. Let me hi highlight just one of many examples, an example of what happens to an employee, a student employee in publications and graphics. Doctrine and Covenant section 123 verse 12 talks about people who are looking for the truth, but they know not where to find it. A lot of what we do here is search engine optimization, or SEO, which is taking our content and optimizing it in such a way that it shows up more in search results for those people who would otherwise not know where to find it. Since starting this job, I have fallen so in love with deep data, analytics, and the idea of what data can do for the world that I've decided to change my major to data science. Even more important to me than the experience I'm getting on the job is the inspiration that comes with it. A core part of what we do is going through classic speeches looking for 
a quote, a section, or even the entire speech that we could share with the world and help others come closer to Christ. In December, my wife and I had our first child, a baby boy. When he was one month old, he contracted RSV and spent many long days and nights in the hospital. As I sat in the emergency room, holding my little baby boy, watching him struggle for every breath, I felt like I was drowning in fear. I needed something to grasp onto. I remembered coming across a talk from Elder Joseph B. Worthlin on the topic of prayer. In that talk, he said, we will never, never be alone so long as we know how to pray. We prayed and prayed, and eventually our prayers turned from pleading to gratitude as our baby boy got stronger and stronger. So my experience here isn't just preparing me for my first job, it's preparing me for the eternities. What a great example of inspiring learning, not in a classroom, not in a course, but in employment from an academic support unit. That is what we hope can happen everywhere on campus, before, during, and after the pandemic. I thank and love each of you for what you contribute to our mission, especially in these trying times. I don't think any university community has worked harder, more diligently, or more cooperatively than has ours to allow our students to gather in a safe way to learn in an atmosphere of faith the lessons of eternity that are available here. Now, I should acknowledge that no matter how hard we have worked, things will not all go according to plan. We will have to adjust. It is possible that we will have to abruptly return to remote delivery and maybe early in the semester. But we will continue to focus on the essentials outlined in our mission statement, confident that we are laying the foundation of a great work and that as we act righteously, even as we are acted upon, we will, with God's help, succeed because this is part of his work which will not fail. I witness that God lives. He has a perfect plan for his children, each one of us. Because of the atoning sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, Christ has the power to make all things right. And this is part of his work at this university. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.